right, well, the message this morning, if you have your handouts, is the testimony of God is greater. The testimony of God is greater. Do you believe that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to open your word. And I pray that we would behold wonderful things from your word this morning. I pray you'd speak to each one of our hearts today to know more of who you are and to worship you in truth. And God, I pray that you would help me this morning to open my mouth, to preach your word, and to exalt Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Gideon versus Wainwright. Gideon versus Wainwright was a landmark decision by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1963, March 18th, 1963, Gideon versus Wainwright. And as a result of that decision, there was an, an amendment to the Constitution. The Sixth Amendment to the Constitution was because of the case of Gideon versus Wainwright. And the amendment centered around the requirement that the United States would provide attorneys to criminal defendants who were unable to afford their own. You know that amendment, right? If you don't have an attorney, it will be provided for you. When I was looking at this, I was shocked to learn that that didn't happen until 1963. Gideon versus Wainwright. Well, why did that have to happen? How, how did that get sparked? What was Gideon versus Wainwright? Well, Clarence Earl Gideon was accused of breaking into a pool hall at 5.30 in the morning and stealing money and alcohol. Clarence Gideon. And the lone witness was a guy named Henry Cook. Henry Cook happened to be at the pool hall where Gideon was at 5.30 in the morning. You're a little suspicious of that too, aren't you? So Henry Cook testified it was him. It was Gideon that did it. It was Clarence. So Clarence got arrested. The trial was one day. He was, had no attorney afforded him. He was convicted on the testimony of Henry Cook and sent to jail for five years. So he's sitting in the jail. He has no recourse. He doesn't know what to do. So he asks for a pen and paper, and he writes a letter to the Supreme Court of the United States and mails it. <laughs> and they got it. And they heard the case. And they amended the Constitution of the United States. Can you believe that? Testimony. Testimony matters. Henry Cook stood on the witness stand and testified, and the judge believed him. And the judge convicted Clarence on the testimony of Henry Cook and sentenced Clarence to five years in jail. The Supreme Court, they amended it. He got Clarence, to wrap it up for you, Clarence did get out of jail. He, they got an attorney that was retried, and he was found to be innocent. And um, Henry Cook, they suspected he might have been guilty, but they didn't have enough evidence to convict him. <laughs> testimony. Testimony. You know, John uses the word testimony. He uses trial language. In this text we're going to look at today, he uses the, the word testimony or testify eight times in the seven verses we're going to look at. Testify, testimony, eight times in the seven verses verses we'll cover. And it's courtroom language. It's the idea of testifying under oath, testifying to what is true. Henry Cook testified and he lied about his story. He lied. He did not speak the truth. But we're going to look at testimony today. And as I told you, we're going to look at the testimony of God. The testimony of God is greater. John brings up specifically in this text three witnesses that we will say are going to be on the witness stand. Three witnesses on the witness stand today. Let's look at our text. 1 John 5, we'll look at verses 6 through 12. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men... The testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his son. 
And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. When you testify and you raise your right hand, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. What is God's testimony concerning his son? That's the heart of this text. What is God's testimony concerning his son? And who are the witnesses? Who are the witnesses that are going to testify concerning his son? We saw the water, the blood, and the spirit. What does that mean? What is God's testimony about his son? These are the three witnesses. We will look first at the flawed testimony of man, and then we will end looking at the sure testimony of God. We're going to look into the text first. We're going to go into the middle of the text, and then we're going to work our way out. We're going to go into the middle, and we're going to work our way out. Notice first the flawed testimony of man. Did you see that in 1 John 5, verse 9? 9, the first half of verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men. If we receive the testimony of men. This is, again, courtroom language. John is making the argument here from lesser to greater. If we receive the testimony of men, the idea would be how much more should we receive the testimony of of God, right? This is the idea. Built into the statement is the truth that human testimony can be faulty or can be inaccurate. Just like Henry Cook testified and he lied about Clarence. Right? If we receive the flawed testimony of men, you know, when people communicate, it doesn't matter. They're under oath. Hey, you just don't forget, you're under oath. And people will still lie through their teeth, won't they? Bill Clinton did it, didn't he? <laughs> Others did it under oath. This is courtroom language. But people, even under oath, will lie, and we will believe them. It's, you know, it's built into our system of justice that the testimony of people under oath is meant to be believed. But we know it's also true that under oath people will lie. They can be false. Now listen, I want us to consider what John is driving at here. We studied through the Gospel of John. We're walking through the epistle of 1 John. This is John's writing. Listen, I, I, consider this one question as we think about what John is saying about the testimony of man. And what he's saying about the testimony of God. What is John's big point in all of his writings, in his gospel and in this letter? I I think his big point is this, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is John's purpose in his writing, the purpose in the writing of his gospel. That's from the gospel of John. But that is the purpose of why he's writing his epistle, that people may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing, you would have eternal life, life in his name. This is why John is writing. He's, he's, he's making a case continually over and over again. That's what the Gospel of John was about. There were seven signs that we walked through through the Gospel of John proving that Jesus was the Son of God. And now he's going over and over again. This is why I want you to believe. And here is evidence after evidence after evidence. And so John's not just leaning into a general reasoning about life, about things that are trivial. He's making a case about things that have to do with eternity. He's making a case about things that have eternal value, that matter, eternal priorities. John is interested only in one argument, and it is the eternal argument. He's not interested in pondering trivial things. He's interested in helping people to consider eternal matters. So if we receive the testimony of men, how much more would we receive the testimony of God? So as considering eternal matters, which is what John is after, as considering us thinking deeply about life and death and eternity and salvation, As considering eternal matters, what is the flawed testimony of men concerning eternal matters? That, to me, is a logical question. What does man say about eternal matters? What does human wisdom say about things that are eternal, about salvation, about how you can become a Christian? What does the testimony of human wisdom say about eternal matters? Well, I've thought about a few things that human wisdom says about eternal matters. 
human wisdom says you don't like the God of your parents, you don't like the God of the church down the street, create your own religion. We read it in, in, in Isaiah 40, Pastor Scott read that in Isaiah 40, about gods that are made with human hands. So we, we do that in society. Humans do that. We, we want to create our own religion. That's human wisdom concerning eternal matters. Another thing that reflects human wisdom is this idea that we should look inward. The power is in us. That we, are our, we become our own saviors. So, so we, we not only create our own religion, but we center the religion on ourselves. that, that it's, it's in us. And, and, and some forms of Christianity will, will mix in this self-help religion into Christianity, and it becomes a false version of Christianity, where we don't need Christ. Christ is nice, and we like him on Christmas, and we don't really like him in Revelation, so we won't study that book. But we like him at Christmas, and Jesus is just this thing, that, that this guy that was really good and... and, and and loving and compassionate, but really what we do is, is we just worship ourselves. We just need Jesus to prop us up, to give us, to give us kind of some good advice about how to make it through life. And so we just look inward. Jesus is outside of us, so we just look, we take his advice, but then we, we look inward. That's human wisdom. Here's another version of human wisdom when it comes to eternal matters. All roads lead to the same destination. Sincerity is all that matters. That's human wisdom. All roads, wouldn't that, that's human wisdom. God just wants you to be sincere. You know, it's interesting, I, I had put this point in my message, this thought in my message a couple of days ago, and I just heard the audio of the Pope. Did you hear the audio of the Pope? Just a couple of days ago. He's in, a, he's in Singapore speaking to some young people. Did you hear it? This is the head of the Catholic Church supposed to be a Christian religion that believes that Jesus is salvation. Listen to the Pope. Pope Francis spoke to a group of young people in Singapore. I, I confirmed it. I was like, this can't be true. He says this, quote, All religions are paths to reach God. They are, to make a comparison, like different languages, different dialects, to get there. But God is God for all. If you start to fight saying, my religion is more important than yours, mine is true and yours isn't, where will this lead us? There's only one God. He's right about that. And each of us has a language to arrive at that God. Some are Sikh, some are Muslim, some are Hindu, and some are Christian. They are different ways to God. This is human wisdom. This is earthly wisdom wisdom. This is demonic wisdom. That's what you, that's the flawed testimony of man. Henry Cook is on the stand lying through his teeth and the Pope is lying through his teeth to these young people. And on the video you have these Muslims, these Hindus and these Muslims sitting on the stage and they're, they're nodding and they're clapping and they're agreeing, yes, yes, yes. Human wisdom also says that morality is relative. Ultimate truth is not knowable. Morality is up to you. You decide what you want to do. Ultimate truth, we can't really know it. That's human wisdom. Ult uh, uh, um, human wisdom as concerning eternal matters says live for the moment. Seek pleasure as the ultimate pursuit. Ignore eternal matters altogether. That's human wisdom. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. The wisdom of man. Human wisdom, the flawed wisdom of man, the flawed testimony of man. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God, but I don't need God. I don't need God, right? I have my own wisdom. I create my own religion. I have my own morality. In fact, I'm not worried about morality. I'm just going to live for the moment. We see that, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 32. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's human wisdom. Let us eat, let us drink, for tomorrow we die. Eternal realities? Eternal realities? Stopping and thinking about life after death? Considering life's choices and the fact that there might be more to life than just pleasure and money and food and possessions? No, no, no. Human wisdom, human wisdom, earthly demonic thinking, the flawed testimony of man says, let us eat, let us drink, for tomorrow we die. You know, James chapter 3, 
It talks about two kinds of wisdom. James 3, 14 through 15, James says this, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above. That's the first kind of wisdom, the wisdom that comes from where? From God, godly wisdom, which we'll look at here in a minute. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but this wisdom, this other wisdom, it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Demonic. This is the folly of human wisdom, earthly wisdom, so-called wisdom. Jesus talked about human wisdom in a parable. I think it's one of the most profound parables. Lots of great parables that Jesus told to illustrate spiritual truths. This is such a profound one. It's Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, 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 you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You see it? You see the comparison between human wisdom and godly wisdom, earthly wisdom, Demonic wisdom versus godly wisdom. The parable is illustrating the point that this rich fool, he thought his security was in his bigger barns filled with more stuff and more possessions and more grain and more things, but he wasn't concerned about his soul. He wasn't thinking about eternal matters. Listen, listen, if we believe the testimony of men, men, what do men say about eternal matters? This rich fool, fool reflects the the flawed testimony of humanity concerning life and death, concerning heaven and eternity. This rich fuel, oh fool, this night your soul is required of you. Your stuff, your stuff, who's going to take it? Who's going to take it? It's not going to be yours anymore. You should rather be rich towards God. You'd rather be rich towards God. And that is really true. We will either be rich in our own self, our own self-help religion, our own works. We will either be rich in our possessions and trusting in them, or we will be rich towards God. Only two options. Where will you be rich in? Speaking of money, do you give your children an allowance? Do you? I have some kids. Little Lincoln, little buddy. So Joel, Joel went off to college, right? So Joel's duty was bringing the garbage bags to the can and to the road. And I have to say, Lincoln's doing a better job than, than Joel did. And Joel, I'm sorry. Um, but, but, I mean, Lincoln's like this tall, and the garbage can is this tall. And, man, the guy is working hard getting the can to the road. And so we promised him we are going to give him $10 after... after uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks of doing that, $5 a week or something. And, and so that's normal, right? You give your kid $5 a week, $20 a month. And I mean, I grew up not getting allowance. You, you, your, your, your allowance was, hey, you get to eat, <laughs> you get to sleep, you get air conditioning, <laughs> you get a bed to sleep in. Uh, have you heard of Cristiano Ronaldo, Portuguese soccer player, one of the greatest soccer players alive, him and Messi, right? Well, Cristiano Ronaldo said on TikTok that he gives his teenage son an allowance. How much do you think he gives his son for an allowance weekly? Think it's more than five dollars? What? Tell me some numbers. A thousand? Five thousand go up. Ten thousand go up. 
$15,000 a week, $470,000 a year for his haircuts and his girlfriends, he said. <laughs> what in the world? Hu full human wisdom, earthly wisdom, focuses on all the things that you can get from what you have, from the resources that you have. Would it be true that Cristiano Ronaldo would quit giving his son $15,000 a week and would come to faith in Jesus Christ and teach his kid what matters most? This is human earthly wisdom. And John is addressing the most important reality to consider, and this is the reality of eternity. E eternal matters, heavenly matters, the, ma the matters of truth and existence. Why are we here? What's my purpose in life? So the question for all of us today is, Whose testimony, under oath, on eternal matters will we listen to? The world's wisdom, our own wisdom, or godly biblical wisdom? You know, King Solomon, he, he tried earthly wisdom. If you want to see his commentary on his attempts at earthly wisdom, you can read the book of Ecclesiastes. One section in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 2, listen to Solomon. Solomon said, I said to myself, Lots of people, the rich fool talked to himself, and Solomon was talking to himself. I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my, my, my many flourishing groves. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me. And my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. But as I looked at everything, I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. You ever tried to catch the wind? That's what Solomon is saying. You can't catch the wind. Trying to find meaning and purpose in things and stuff apart from Christ is like chasing the wind. If we receive the testimony of men, the flawed testimony of men about eternal matters, it will be like we are chasing after the wind. Chasing after the wind. The flawed testimony of men. Notice next, though, we have available. We have available the sure testimony of God. Look back to our text. Let's go back to the beginning of our text. We saw in the middle, if we believe the flawed, if we believe the testimony of men, look at verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. What's John saying here? No confusing language. This is he who came by water and blood, Christ, water, blood, the Spirit testifies. These three are the ones on the witness stand, water, blood, and Spirit. This is a callback, three witnesses. This is a callback to the laws for God's people whenever there was a charge brought against another person. Just like Henry Cook was the only witness, Clarence had no lawyer and only one witness against him. When Deuteronomy... Chapter 19, verse 15, this was the law for God's people in Israel. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. So John is using that argument. we got three witnesses here. My point, John is saying my point is Jesus is God. He's the son of God. Would you believe me? I wrote out all the signs that he did in my gospel, in, in, in my account of, of walking with him. I wrote down all that he did. Would you believe? Would you believe? Now listen, if you won't believe, look, there's three witnesses. There's th I, I have enough evidence to prove that he's God. I have three witnesses, the water, the blood, and the spirit. Well, what does that mean, the water, the blood, and the spirit are testifying to who Jesus is? How does the water, the blood, and the spirit testify to who Jesus is? Well, the water is Jesus' baptism. 
at Jesus' baptism, there was testimony to who he was, the water. Do you remember his baptism? How did his baptism testify to who he was? Well, who baptized him? John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He preached a message of repentance, and he said, listen, there's one that's coming that's mightier than I. The sandals of his, on his feet I'm not worthy to untie. There's a mighty one coming, and the mighty one is not me. He pointed forward to Christ, and Christ came. And what did John say when Jesus walked towards baptism? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So at his baptism, you have testimony to who is Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. At his baptism, there's a testimony, there's a witness to who Jesus is. And then Jesus gets baptized. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. It wasn't a dove. It was like a dove. It wasn't fire. Like fire, it was like a dove. It was gentle, coming and resting on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. John declares at Jesus' baptism, This is the Son of God. And at his actual baptism, when Jesus rises from the water, the Holy Spirit descends on him in some way that is visible. And the voice from heaven declares, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. This is the first testimony. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The water testifies today. The baptism of Jesus Christ testifies Jesus is the son of God. The water. Well, what about the blood? What does the blood represent? Well, the blood is the cross. At the cross, there was testimony to who Jesus was. Was there not? Listen to what happened at the death of Jesus. What happened when Jesus gave up his spirit? No one took his life. He gave it up willingly. What happened? Look at Matthew 27, verse 50. It says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from where? From top to bottom. That's a testimony. Who can tear a curtain from top to bottom unless you have a ladder? Obviously, it was God. God was testifying at the death of Christ. At the death of Christ, God was testifying to who Jesus was. The, 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 the curtain was torn from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Who's doing that? Who's testifying about his son? God is. The death of Christ testifies. The tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints who were fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs. Wow. I think that's a testimony that something special was happening at the death of Christ. Wouldn't you agree? Would you agree, would you agree that that testimony is pretty rock solid? This account doesn't say it, but darkness in the middle of the day, like there was no sun, a total eclipse. What a sign. You know there were those who believed the testimony of the blood of the cross? Listen to this, verse 54 When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was who? The Son of God. This was the Son of God. His death was confirmed by the Father with supernatural signs. Truly, this was the Son of God. The water at his baptism, it testifies. There was testimony. He is the Son of God. At his death... There is testimony, truly this was the Son of God. And now the Spirit, the third witness. The Holy Spirit testifies to who Jesus is. Do you remember Jesus was conceived of who? The Holy Spirit. Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 4, Jesus was led of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus cast out some demon spirits. And the Pharisees said that Jesus casted out those demon spirits by the power of Satan. And listen to what... Jesus said to them in Matthew 12, Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What is being said here? Listen, what's being said here is that these Pharisees were saying that Jesus worked a miracle of delivering 
a person from demons by the power of Satan and not by the power of the Spirit. They're attributing that power to Satan and not to God. And the Spirit, the reason, the reason that's so significant is that the Spirit is there, the Holy Spirit is there to point to Christ. So when you attribute the workings of God to Satan, you are blaspheming the Spirit's purpose to point to Christ. Did you follow that? Jesus spoke of the role of the Holy Spirit as a witness to him. John 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, the Holy Spirit, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He, he will glorify me. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is the witness to Christ testifies to who Christ is. Three witnesses to who Jesus is, the water, the blood, and the spirit. Is that clear? This is not meaning physical birth, water, and blood, and then the Holy Spirit. This is not meaning that salvation comes through baptism, water, and repentance, and then the Holy Spirit. That's not a three-step salvation process here. This is baptism, this is the cross, and this is the Holy Spirit testify that Jesus is God. Amen? The testimony of God is sure. Now what do these three testify? What do they agree on? What do they agree on? What is established by the three witnesses who testify? Look back to our text, verse 11 and 12. This is the testimony, and look, this is what John is saying. This testimony is pointing to this. The water, the blood, and the Holy Spirit are testifying to this, and this is their testimony. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life, eternal life, is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is the testimony we see at his baptism, at the cross, and what the Holy Spirit does. Testimony that only through Christ can sins be forgiven. Only through Christ can we have salvation. Only through Christ comes eternal life. It comes from the Son of God. It comes from Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. If you don't have Jesus, you are lost. If you have Jesus, you have life. If you don't have him as your Savior, if you've not repented and believed in Christ and his payment for your sins, you don't have the Savior, you are lost. Not according to the Pope, but according to the Bible. Jesus is the Son of God. This is the simple yet profound reality of the gospel. You have Christ, you have life. You don't have Christ, you don't have life. This is Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. John 6, 35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Only in Christ can someone find true spiritual food. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the door. John 10, so Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me, came before me, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. That's Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is the door. He is the door into salvation. He is the door into the sheepfold. Only in Christ can you find truth, satisfaction, and salvation because Jesus is the way. John 14, 5 through 6, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the door of the sheep. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to the Father. There is no other religion that leads to God. If we are followers of Jesus Christ here today, we have found the way. Amen. And Jesus is the true vine. John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Human earthly wisdom says you can do a lot to fix your spiritual problems. 
But Jesus says, I'm the vine. Apart from me, you can't bear any spiritual fruit. You must be born again. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch. Do you get it? If you don't abide in Christ, you bear no spiritual fruit. What do you do with trees that don't bear fruit? I was talking to Ryan earlier this morning about all his 300 fruit trees that he has in his property. If those fruit trees that Ryan has in his property don't bear fruit, what does he do? He prunes them. But if they eventually die, he cuts them down. This is the picture. Spiritual fruit only comes from being connected to Christ. Every other connection produces dead works that account for nothing. That account for nothing. Jesus is the true vine. And this is God's testimony concerning his son Jesus. He is the bread who truly satisfies. Anybody been satisfied in Christ? He is the door that his true sheep enter through. Have you walked through the door? He is the way, the truth, and the, and the life. Have you found that way? And he is the true vine. Are you abiding in him? Spiritual fruit being produced in your life? Earthly wisdom rejects that. If we believe the testimony of men, the testimony of men concerning eternity is do it yourself. The testimony of God is behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the testimony of God. Behold the Son of God. Truly, this was the Son of God. That's the testimony of God, the sure testimony of God. And if you're here today and you are only believing in earthly demonic wisdom about eternity, repent, believe, trust in Christ. In the late 1940s, Charles Templeton was a partner with Billy Graham. Charles Templeton would preach large crusades with Billy Graham. Thousands and thousands of people in the late 1940s. And many said when they would listen to Billy Graham and then listen to Charles Templeton, Charles Templeton was so much better of a communicator than Billy Graham. And as Charles Templeton and Billy Graham worked together and life went, went on and they were doing ministry there's two main differences between Billy and Charles. And one of them is this, is that Billy continued in the faith. Charles eventually rejected Jesus altogether. And he wrote a book about it. And as a, a, a desire, in a desire to, to hear Charles Templeton and to understand what he was thinking and why he did this, Lee Strobel, who wrote the book A Case for Christ, the movie was made because of the book, A Case for Christ. Lee Strobel interviewed 83-year-old Charles Templeton. One of the most compelling parts of the interview, where Lee is interviewing Charles, who rejected Christ, preached Christ like I just did as the only way to salvation, and then rejected Christ and wrote a book about it. Lee asked him, what about Jesus? I get what you're saying about human suffering, and you have these questions about why a good God would allow this and that, and I understand, and I can walk you through some of those things, Lee said, but, but what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Talk to me about Jesus. This is Charles Templeton. Quote, he was the greatest human being who has ever lived. He was a moral genius. His ethical sense was unique. He was the intrinsically wisest person I've ever encountered in my life or in my readings. He is the most important thing in my life. I know it may sound strange, but I say I adore him. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned from Jesus. He is the most important human being who has ever existed. And if I may put it this way, I miss him. In the interview, Templeton's eyes fill with tears and he wept. And he cut the interview off. He refused to say anything else. We will either believe the testimony of man concerning Jesus, earthly wisdom, or we will believe the testimony of God. And if we will believe the testimony of man, human, flawed, earthly, demonic wisdom, we may well find ourselves like Charles Templeton weeping over what we miss. You know, the testimony of Henry Cook in 63 proved to be false, didn't it? 
this flawed testimony of man. And in a similar way, the testimony of so-called earthly wisdom will prove false in time. It will always prove empty. So my question to you today as we end is this. If you were put on the witness stand today, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. What would be your testimony concerning Jesus Christ? Would you be like Henry Cook? Would you be a liar? Would you be like Charles Templeton? Or would you be like Peter, who testified, Matthew 16, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, that's good, that's good, that's good. I like it, yes, there's lots of rumors about me, guys, but who do you? I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Guys, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter raised his hand and testified, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Is that your testimony? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your goodness to us that we can be saved and that we can testify like Peter that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, that is our testimony, and we declare to you today that we love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. Lord, we want to love you with all that we are so that we can love others and point them to the only hope of salvation. Lord, so we thank you for what you've done for us in Christ. And if there's anyone here today that has not committed to Christ, Lord, I pray today that they would do so that they would respond in faith, that they would repent and believe in Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.